Yeah, we'll see where we cut off in that previous broadcast about Joseph and his brothers. I think I finished pointing out that while Joseph was obviously called by God for some particular service to to Israel, to the um, continuation of that apostleship of, of the nation in, in its particular place. Nevertheless, he's, he, has these, he has these revelations of his brothers bowing down to him. And uh, as I said, he was a bit of a conceited twit because he went around boasting about it. And of course, his brothers were irritated and upset with him and became more and more angry. He already envied him because he was the father's favorite. But he provoked even more envy. He was 17 years old and immature, and he was not going to be able to fulfill his service to God before he also had gone through sufferings and hardships and been purified. And uh, then, uh, having learned some meekness and humility, he would be able to carry out God's will and fulfill the, the plan that God had for him in the unfolding of the story of man's fall and movement toward the redemption which was to come through the promise of God in the fullness of time. So Joseph is taken, seized by his brethren, thrown into uh, a pit, and um, at first they wanted to kill him, but I believe it was Reuben, if I'm not mistaken, who intervened, uh, suggesting the brother just sort of throw him into a pit and, and abandon him. Well, Reuben, of course, intended to rescue him later. But uh, meanwhile, while the br brothers are having their lunch, along comes a caravan going into Egypt to trade. And the brothers decide to sell Joseph into bondage and that he would be carried away into Egypt. Now, this is uh, certainly would appear to us that this was all worked out in the order of God's plan, that God was preparing Joseph to become the salvation of his brothers and his mother, his father, when the great famine would strike that land and they would have to go someplace in order to, to have sustenance. It, it seems that the holy nation also, in order to serve God's plan at all, would have to go through suffering and humiliation to come to some kind of meekness before God and be suitable to be apostles, to the apostleship uh, that they had in revealing the one true and living God to the nations. Well, Joseph has to go through this same sort of purification and, and suffering. It's easy to see how this applies to us as well, because very often as believers, as well, we're Orthodox Christians, we can fall into a kind of conceit and uh, a kind of a kind of arrogance and a kind of self assurance and it can happen to every single one of us and we need sometimes to be humbled and that hum that humbling can come through any number of ways it can come through um, our own mistakes and errors it can come about as the response of other people to our own conceit and uh, it can come about because God allows that we should be sometimes attacked, sometimes slandered, sometimes maligned, sometimes even physically attacked, all kinds of ways that we can be brought to some kind of humility so that we can more properly serve the purpose which God has for us. We cannot do that really when we're in a state of some kind of arrogance and uh, self-assurance. So these things happen to us and we're in a way purified by them if we accept that suffering and those things for what they really are. Uh, we sometimes react or overreact to them, but when we learn not to react and overreact, when we learn to accept this the kind of, uh, of humbling that comes to us, then we can experience a kind of purification and we can more completely fulfill God's will and God's plan for us. But as a matter of fact, in so many aspects of life, we often need to pass through some kind of failures or uh, some kind of humbling experiences in order to make us better people and to make us true followers of Jesus Christ. So these things come upon us 
as much as a blessing as, uh, as something negative. We don't suffer just because God likes to see us suffer. We have to be allowed some failings and weaknesses and things because of our own fallen human nature. It's the only way to bridle our energies so that they can be used in a proper and appropriate manner. And so this often has to come to pass as we struggle to, first of all, struggle to be servants of our Lord Jesus Christ and followers, and also uh, so that we can be of some use and benefit to other human beings. So we see in the story both of Jacob and of Joseph, and particularly of Joseph, that this, this suffering, this humiliation, this sorrow and grief have, have to come to pass in order for him to be prepared for the great uh, act of rescue and to the, the fulfilling of God's will, as a part also of the humbling of the holy nation, the humbling of Israel, and preparing them to become the nation in Canaan and to be the witnesses to the nations about the one true and living God. It cannot be done until there has been suffering, humbling, and some kind of meekness come upon them. We ourselves should learn, therefore, to accept that when it comes upon us and to take it as a part of the preparation for our service to God and to others and uh, for us to be able, in, in a genuine and sincere manner, to have some kind of co-suffering love for others. If we don't suffer ourselves, it's difficult to see how we can co-suffer. If we uh, don't have to depend upon the unselfish love of others sometimes, then it's more difficult for us to give pure unselfish love toward others. So these things come upon us as a part of giving us strength, giving us courage, and of giving us a, a meekness that will help us to reach out to other people on an even plane and to reach out to them with the kind of co-suffering love that actually equals righteousness. Joseph will be completely forgiving to his brothers in the fullness of time, receive them, make it possible for them to survive, but at the same time prepare the way for Israel to become humbled and to become purified through suffering to become the kind of, of servants of God that they should be. And this, of course, as you remember, will take a very long time. And it, the amazing thing is that in the suffering and the exile that is to come upon Israel, that they do remember the living one who sees them, the true and living God. So we'll uh, continue our story uh, just to end the book of Genesis very shortly. I think one more broadcast. And uh, someone wrote and said they're anxious to hear about the story of Caleb. That doesn't come along until the book of Numbers, so it will be a little while before we get there. But uh, in any case, this will bring us almost to the conclusion of the book of Genesis. I only want to point out that the book of Genesis begins with the creation, and it begins in paradise. It begins in paradise, but it ends in a coffin in Egypt.